there's this disc set called uh, Sesame Street Old School because we wanted to introduce him to Sesame that we grew up with. Yeah. So there's this animated like disclaimer in the beginning <laughs> saying that some things Not good were done music. then. And just like, so, you know, even though we're teaching over, under, round and through, like don't go to a construction site, kids. Don't go through <laughs> rusted tubes. <laughs> don't go across sources. <laughs> yeah, like, don't make it fun. Yeah, we made fun. A disclaimer saying this is why your parents are so weird. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's bring out our guests and ask them to come out and play, because everything is A-OK. -okay. Our first guest is an actor and singer whose credits include Hawaii Five-0, Lou Grant, Law and & Order, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Today, he joins us today to talk about being one of the humans of Sesame Street as its favorite fix-it shop owner, Louise, for 390 episodes. Please welcome Emilio Delgado. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Nice hey. to see you. Hey. <laughs> uh, how are you today, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Really great. Thank you. Oh, so glad to have you here. So glad to have you here. So yeah, before I bring out uh, your peers and stuff, I yeah, you have some interesting stuff on your on your non uh, Sesame Street career. I'd love to chat about it with real quick. Uh, first of all, just because I'm a fan, um, you did a you did a, you did a one episode of Hawaii Five O, and it's curious because you did it with Mr. Buck Rogers himself, Gil Gerard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any recollections? For, any recollections from that? Oh, that, uh, that was a terrific part, mainly, of course, because uh, I got hired to work in Hawaii for that episode. Yeah, <laughs> I was the I was a bad guy of the week uh, on that one. And uh, it was just fun, you know, uh, being the bad guy and uh, doing all this ugly stuff to uh, all these other people. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, and, and, and this was, of course, during the time when I was, uh, you know, still on Sesame Street. <laughs> so <laughs> having yeah. come from uh, Sesame Street and all of that, you know, stuff and all that beautiful stuff and everything. And then this guy being a, a bad guy. But, uh, yeah. But, I mean, the bad guys always get caught. I was caught at the end of the episode, so. And you it. were, and um, hey, hey, you got to spend at least a week in uh, Hawaii and so. Oh, it was longer than that. It was like was 10, it? 12 days. Oh, I that's nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jack Lord was uh, rather infamous, but uh, everybody said, if you get a Hawaii Five-0, take it for the Hawaiian vacation. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that I was the game. Pregnant. And uh, you also had a recurring character on Lou Grant, which, curiously enough, during um, quarantine, I. I rewatched recently and I found it's, it still holds up remarkably well. Wow. That was a very well produced directed show. It was, uh, you know, Gene Reynolds. He yeah. was fantastic. And uh, Ed Asner, of course, I mean, he was like an amazing actor, you know? And uh, I just remember very, uh, uh, very well how uh, we used to be sitting around the editor's table, uh, picking out what the news were going to be for that day. And, and before we were, uh, before the cameras came on, and Asner was telling us all these jokes, and he's an amazing <laughs> joke teller. Really? You know? And he had us in stitches the whole time we were there until the cameras came on. Then everybody got serious. Mm, yes. Well, it was a serious show, to say the least. <laughs> but just my, yeah, just it really pushed the envelope of uh, what topics were allowed on television at the time. Oh, yeah. And, and was again, this was concurrent years. with you about Sesame Street. I'm sorry, what was the last this, one? This was concurrent with you uh, being on yeah, Sesame Street as well. time, right? Because uh, during those years, I was working uh, both coasts, as they used to say. Yeah. Uh, I would do Sesame Street when we were through filming at Sesame Street. I'd go back to California, where I'm originally from. So I was very happy doing that because for many years, I missed all the weather in New York during the, the winter. You know. Yeah. So uh, I would go uh, on uh, December... December 31st, we'd finish, and I'd fly the next day and be at uh, Malibu Beach the next day. Uh, oh, that's, a, that's a turnaround. Uh, <laughs> and uh, recently you did, uh, you have the poster of the background, uh, Quixote Nuevo. Tell us about that. Oh, fantastic show. That was a play that we did, uh, written by Octavio Solis, a uh, Mexican-American uh, playwright, and directed by uh, a Mexican-American, uh, K.J. Sanchez. And both of them are absolutely amazing. We had an, an amazing cast, all of us Latinos and Latinas. And uh, it was the story of uh, sort of like of Quixote, only in a modern day version, right? Okay. And uh, it took place on the border. Uh, the, the town was an, an, an imaginary town invented by uh, Octavio, 
but uh, it would I would say it was probably someplace like El Paso. You know? Okay. It took place around that kind of area. And uh, so, yeah, the, the whole story was about uh, this guy who's a professor in college, and he's kind of losing his mind now, yeah. you know, and uh, he decides to go on a quest and look for his first love, you know. And uh, and he has all these adventures all along the way, and uh, and, it, and it ends beautifully. What can I tell you? And, what? Uh, uh, what what does this version of KOT imagine himself to be? The original chorus was he imagines himself as a, as a medieval knight. Uh, what in this version? What oh, does same he, thing. Same, same thing. thing. He's, still medieval he's knight. A knight. Yeah, he's okay. a knight, and uh, he devises an, in, instead of a horse, he he comes up with this this tricycle. It's kind of like a uh, an adult tricycle that, that yeah he thinks is is Rocinante, his horse, right? Yeah. So he invents all of this. Uh, all of this armor from, um, you know, leftover parts, you know, and automobile parts and what have you. And uh, he thinks he's the knight. He thinks he's the knight and he's going off to uh, fight yeah. for love and whatever. You know, so it, it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, play that we did and uh, very well received by everywhere we went. Outstanding. Well, once again, Mila, thank you for joining us here today. It's an absolute pleasure. My so, pleasure, of course. And uh, speaking of pleasures, our next guest is a puppeteer, writer, and director whose body of work includes The Great Space Coaster, Eureka's Castle, and of course, the performer or voice of Bear in the Playhouse Disney classic, Bear in the Blue Boo House. Today, he joins us to discuss all that as well as shares contributions to Sesame Street, which includes several members of the Snuffleupagus family. Please welcome Noel McNeil. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank hey, you Noel. for joining us. <laughs> Emilio! <laughs> uh, Noel, how are you doing in your part of the world? Uh, great. I'm here in uh, Brooklyn. It's beautiful, like 74 degrees. And so you wouldn't think it was November, but it's it's gorgeous. And so it's it's been it's been lovely. And we're all like, you know, safe and sound. And I'm looking forward to this today and seeing and meeting like so many of you out there. Thank you again for joining us. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. So, uh, I wanted to ask some of the uh, the pre some of the pre uh, Sesame Street stuff. Um, I was a big fan of Space Coaster. I thought, out of all the puppeteering uh, shows, I thought that one actually came the closest to. Oh, that's <laughs> Lola. She uh, says hi. Thank you. Lola. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, when Pumpkin goes around offering her, it's like out of okay. out of all the shows, I I always thought Space Coaster had the closest to capturing that. That really fun irreverent vibe that Henson had created without looking like it was trying to copy the Henson style. So uh, yeah, it was it was a very like unusual show. I came in during the second to last season. I took yeah. over a character that John Lovelady had done named Knock Knock. knock, -knock. It was a little pink uh, bird who would tell uh, knock knock jokes. Yeah, and I I took over. It was the the summer, the same summer, and the same time that Sesame Street was doing its special in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and getting locked overnight. So I remember a couple of times where I was, and, and at that time on Sesame Street, I hadn't fully puppeteered yet. I was still yeah. what's called the Wrangler, taking care of the puppets. So I was wrangling yeah. for Bird and even for Snuffy. So I remember there was like uh, a couple of times where I would have to like go to the museum during the night, like in the middle of the night when we're locked yeah. up and have an all night shoot and then get on the bus and then head down to the Ed Sullivan Theater where we shot Space Coaster, like, and and, um, and just like pretty much no sleep. <laughs> just do that show and then come home, take a nap and then go back to the museum that night <laughs> to, to continue shooting. <laughs> Were you, were, you, were you? Did you have to keep this a little bit on the on the sly, or was it a little bit? Yeah, it's yeah. Like youth really helps. So it's just like you can take a quick cat nap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just be up again. So but I don't advise doing that again at this point. I very much true. So, and I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Bear, which um, so many of my friends were like, oh, "Bear the Blue House, Bear the Blue House." I, I, absolutely, true. I, I, absolute uh, beloved by by the generation that grew up watching it. Uh, Thank you. No, it truly was. Truly was. So many people have, have come forward and expressed their their adornment of it. Uh, just real quick, what's your what's been what's your favorite memory to come out of Bear? Uh, the fact that Bear was like a grown up character because so very rarely are characters uh, grown up characters. They're usually like little kids. Who so is a grown up? So that he he could actually go out of the big blue house and appear on shows like Hollywood Squares and the Wayne Brady Show and yeah. at that time Donnie and Marie. But the best memory was whenever I would do appearances of any kind. I would ask, could I visit uh, a children's hospital? And so having Bear go and actually visit kids 
And sometimes he could go into the room, but sometimes he could just stay in the door. Sometimes yeah. hospitals had like their own little studio. So I could do a show and it could be broadcast to the kids' rooms. Oh, yeah. And being a parent now, I realize that moment where like having a character like that come and suddenly your child isn't a patient anymore. Yeah. And this isn't a doctor and this isn't a nurse taking blood or getting ready for a test. And their par and the parents could actually see their kid be a kid again. And so that's why I really enjoyed it. And one of the best ones was this place called Give Kids the World in yeah. Central Florida, which I always like tell people to donate to if you're down there, um, volunteer. I'm actually gonna do uh, a charity event on their behalf in March. And oh. it's gonna be a, a, um, a panel where it reunites me and Tyler Bunch and Vicki Eibner and Peter Litz. So wow. yes, so go to Give Kids the World and, and find out the info for that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and as a Florida boy myself, I am certainly very familiar with it. Oh, she finally arrived. Okay, here. Oh. You showed us yours, I'll show you mine. Oh, yeah, look at the a, eyes. Yeah, it's just pumpkin. She's a diva and she knows it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, our next guest. He is a puppeteer performer whose body of work includes Fraggle Rock, Dark Crystal, and the creative force behind the fantastic YouTube series Cave In with Weldon, the IT guy. IT standing for Internet Troll. Today, he joins us to discuss all of that as well as his contributions to Sesame Street, which include Ernie and Kermit the Frog. Please welcome our good friend, Steve Whitmire. Yes, hi, I'm just puppeteering hey, you right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, boy, you, you're tight, man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Goodbye. well, you know, I exercise. <laughs> hey, guys, how is everybody? Uh, Hello, Steve. Good. Uh, good to see you all. Good to see you all. Uh, good to see you again, Steve. How you been holding up? Uh, good. Uh, doing well. Doing well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of sheltering in place. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, for those of you, for those of us who don't know, uh, tell our audience about Weldon because you've been doing a lot of fantastic work with him lately, or maybe you've been working for him lately. Yeah, it feels like that sometimes. Yeah, Weldon was just kind of an accident that happened. Uh, he was a he's a character that uh, actually came out of a sketch I did of a of a style of puppet I wanted to build, and I hadn't built a puppet in about thirty five years, and I just jumped into giving it a shot and uh, got lucky really, cause I'm not that good at it. But we do a live stream with him once a month. He's an internet troll and he's an actually meant to be part of the species as well. He is a troll. And so Weldon takes, um, essentially does a call in show where people call in like we're talking now and uh, can talk to Weldon. Uh, we do about an hour show every month. It's about all I can manage to pull together. Uh, and we do these big Muppet like production numbers in the middle, which I love trying to do. I love and hate, it's, it's a mixed thing. They're incredibly hard to do. And, uh, but, it, but it's a great way for me to sort of brush up my skill set on the parts of production that I haven't been as involved in because I'm doing all of this, you know? <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So, well, again, uh, I, I, I absolutely recommend the show. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, uh, it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun and it shows. It's out there on YouTube and you can find it if you go to the Cave In YouTube channel. Although the best way to find it is to search his name, Weldon the IT guy. I think there's some other Cave In thing out there on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, fair yeah. enough. Well, I, 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 I think, I think we'll, we'll know the right one when we see it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll be able to tell. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And finally, she is a puppeteer and former staffer of the Children's Television Workshop here today to discuss her own contributions to Sesame Street, as well as those of her late husband, the great puppeteer, Carol Spinney. Please welcome our most honored guest. Yes, Deborah Spinney. Hey, Debbie. Hey. She's coming. She's coming. I'm in. I'm just so, uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this, and I get to see. Where are you, oh, Deborah? Debbie, we can see, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, can I can see me. Oh. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put my uh, light on. Let me see if I can. <laughs> light over there on her. Um, I don't know why. I have no idea. Um, How do we know it's really you? That's the important <laughs> <part. laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I, um, I, there's in touch well, someone, where? Jude said, I can see her. So that's like, and Samantha uh, is saying, I can see her. I'll tell you what, Deborah, let's do this. Uh, uh, or, or Jude, uh, we'll, 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 we'll take you out of the room and we'll try to bring you back in again. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes that fixes oh, these issues. Yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. then they come back. And little thing is swirling. And what? What? No? <laughs> uh, okay. I'm just saying, I don't it's believe just... it's really her. I don't believe it's her. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Wait. Ah! Yeah, no, no, no. Yes. Okay. I'm here. I didn't. I haven't done a thing. Didn't do anything. That's good. Oh, okay. Hurry. Oh. Ask her something. Hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much. I'm uh, like I said. I'm I'm very very happy to be a part of the whole thing, and just to see everybody's face that I haven't seen for a while. It's it's a uh, it's lovely. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, where are you broadcasting from? Because right now it looks like Stately Wayne Manor. We <laughs> <laughs> always called our place Deer Haven um, because we used to have a lot of deer and they would just eat everything and we'd leave them alone. But um, <laughs> it is Deer Haven, but this is the great room in Deer Haven. And uh, if you could look around, I, I have to tell you I, what I've been doing all day was um, same thing Carol and I always do right after Halloween. We're starting, I started decorating for Christmas. <laughs> so, so don't think I'm crazy, but that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how that's that that's how it rolls. And you're you are not the only one of my by several friends that they they love Halloween because to them it means Christmas is coming. Exactly. <laughs> that's the way it is in this house. <laughs> Viva la difference, yes. indeed. So well, gentlemen and ladies, uh -oh, thank you all for again. joining. <laughs> what? Oh, I'll be waiting. I'll whatever you ask, I can answer, but I can't hear you. Yeah, you're absolutely too. Okay. All right, we'll keep going. Okay, so yeah, okay, we're back. All right, gentlemen and lady. Okay, here at GalaxyCon, we miss the miss having the days when we can have you on our stages, but we look forward to the time when the world does get back to normal, and we can get you mm. back in our physical stages and back having you in front of your fans. In the meantime, we have this, the GalaxyCon virtual stage. We are so pleased to have you here today. And as uh, someone myself, who is part of that kind of first generation of Sesame Street uh, kids, and as someone who has been an older brother to a Sesame Street kid, a later generation, and an, uh, and been an uncle to kids who continue with Sesame Street, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all of you for your contributions to this. And uh, let me just say that it's a testament to the people behind the scenes and yourselves as performers. You know, you are all performers and actors and, and doing this is a testament to your abilities. I thank you for your talents. I commend you for professionalism and I absolutely adore you for your, your performances and contributions to this. Thank oh, you. Stop. Very sweet. <laughs> so our team right now is going through the chat room and pulling out the questions uh, to, to lay for us. In the meantime, though, I would just like to hear how each of you individually got involved in all this. And uh, Deborah, let's start with you. Okay. So uh, where? how did uh, Sesame Street begin for you? For me? Okay. Well, it would. let's go back to 1972. Um, I was one year old. <laughs> before it, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, I was looking for a job in Manhattan, and I went to a um, an a employment agency, and they gave me two jobs to go to an interview on. It was below zero that day, with a wind whistling through the tunnels of, of Manhattan. I had the tiniest mini skirt you ever saw, <laughs> and I was frostbitten. But I went to both interviews. One was at this place called uh, Children's Television Workshop. And another was at the Playtex Bra Company. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, the Children's Television Workshop was offering a, a secretary job, and the Bra Company was offering an assistant to the manager job. So it was a little more of a prestigious job, and it paid more and all that kind of stuff. But there was no way I was going to not go to Sesame Street. So I took that job, and uh, the rest is... Fairy tale history. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, the Brazier well, loss <laughs> is the Children's Television Workshop game. <laughs> 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 so let me ask you this then. How did Carol come to be involved? Uh, well, uh, he, of course, I know who he was, obviously. <laughs> um, and I was there uh, typing away. And he saw me typing. And he came over and he said, would you like to go out to dinner? I had this little cute little pixie haircut and I was like nervous as heck because the hair was big bird was coming over to me to ask me out for a date. But it just so happened that at the time I was, uh, how shall we say, married um, to my <laughs> boyfriend. Yeah. And so I was flattered, but I said, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, I 
uh, thank you, but no thank you. So he walked away and I know I can say, I know this story by heart, but, but the way he told it, and I know he was saying to himself, you know, darn, you know, she was taken. So six months went by and um, I was in, uh, let's see, oh, they had a record, no, I'm trying to think, Christmas party at Tavern on the Green, uh, Sesame Street was throwing this big bash and I was gonna go over to that after work and I did and I see Carol standing there across the room and he looks up and he looks at me and he gives me the greatest smile and I thought, oh, he remembers me. Oh, that's so nice. So I went over to say hi and he started chatting up, you know, like crazy and he says, you wanna stay after and we'll, we'll go out to eat and I said, oh, well, I have to go home and see my husband to get him dinner. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, sorry. <laughs> and then, um, so he, you know, then I don't know how much time went by. I think it was three or four months went by. Uh, now, meanwhile, I hadn't seen him at all. And um, it just so happened that my, that that marriage did not work. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a mistake. But anyway, um, we broke up, uh, you know, amicably. But anyway, I met Carol at a recording session. They, uh, Sesame Street wanted me to teach the kids some songs and then sing on this uh, live album. And Carol sees me across the room and I see him and I think, oh, he's going to remember that he asked me out twice. And um, I go over to him and start smiling and he's smiling and he's like, we're going away on tour uh, next week. But when I come back, will you go out with me? I said, yes, I will, actually. And he went away on tour. He came back. He asked me out. We went out on our first date and we fell madly in love. And 13 days later, he asked me to marry him. Yeah. And, then, and then I had been on a quiz show meanwhile, and I won a trip to Switzerland for two. And we went to this trip uh, <laughs> to Switzerland. And uh, I raised a glass to him and I was gonna toast him. And I said, here's to your persistence. And he looked at me and he said, what does that mean? And I said, well, you know, you always you always came back. You never gave up on me. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, you asked me out when I was typing. You asked me out at the Christmas party. You asked me out at the recording session. And he looked me straight in the face and he said, you were all those girls? <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea. <laughs> that was That's a great little yeah. love story. <laughs> Oh my, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. uh, Emilio, I think you can, you were next, you're part of that original oh. group. How did, uh, how did Sesame Street evolve for you? Oh, uh, well, you know, it, it's a long story, of course, but you know, 50 years ago, oh, am I trying to remember? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was a young actor in Los Angeles. I was trying to jump into Hollywood, so to speak. And uh, I had little few successes, but uh, not too many. I was looking at my last unemployment check, and that was like $40, I think. Uh, and uh, the phone rang, and uh, somebody said, uh, is this Mr. Delgado? And I said, yes. She says, uh, uh, yes, we were wondering if, uh, if you wanted to uh, audition for our show, Sesame Street. And I said, and in my brain, I thought I had never seen Sesame Street. I, I had no idea what it was, you know. Uh, no idea whatsoever. And, I, and because I was staring at my last unemployment check, I thought, work, work, work. And I said, of course. So then, um, yes, Mr. Uh, uh, I forgot his name, Dave Connell, who was the executive director, uh, producer at the time, went to Los Angeles and uh, interviewed me for about 15, 20 minutes. And uh, and he just wanted to know about me, you know, if I spoke Spanish uh, as well as English. Uh, I had a mustache. That was the only year I had a mustache on. And he asked me, he says, uh, would you be willing to shave your mustache? <laughs> and I was thinking, I'll shave anything. <laughs> <laughs> Eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> he, went, he went off. Thank you very much. Went off. I didn't hear from anybody for about a month. And... Uh, so I just kind of kissed it off, as most actors do. After a month, you go to an audition, you don't hear from them. That's it. Yeah, you can go on to something else. And uh, and then about a month later, I got another call, and somebody said, uh, uh, "Mr. John Stone, our executive producer, director, blah 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 blah, because he was everything on the show, wants to meet you. Uh, uh, he's going out to L.A. next week." And I said, "Yes, of course." So I met him at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, and we talked out in the lobby, and. Uh, you know, he asked me some questions about myself, where I was from, blah, 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 this and that. He was just feeling me out, I think, in terms of what kind of person I was, yeah. you know, just, just seeing who I was. And finally, he just looked after about 20 minutes of conversation, he looked at me and he said, well, um, if you want to work for us, uh, be in New York October 11th. 
<laughs> this was like around the middle of September of that year. And 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 I thought, okay. He says, we'll send you a ticket. So that's that's how it happened. Wow. And then uh, like two weeks later, I was on a plane to New York, and it was like space travel. You know, when I arrived here, it was another planet, a yeah. totally another planet. And that, that's how I got to New York on Sesame Street. 390 episodes. <laughs> well, probably more than that. Yeah, probably more than that. But uh, well, well, I got, you're right. You're right. This is this is the overall episode. That's what that's what Internet Movie Database says. So, oh, I, oh okay. Well, 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 they know. I, mean, I know. I don't know either. Anyway, so <laughs> so Nolan, Steve, you guys were on the Henson uh, side of things. So, and which has an interesting relationship with Children's Television Workshop, and that's probably an explanation for another day. But so, <laughs> Noel. How 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 did you do the, the 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 work on Sesame Street? It's like so it's like all these people like have that connection and how I like got into it. So when I uh, was a kid, there was much more puppet shows on. There was Sherry Lewis. There was Paul Winchell, who invented the artificial heart, by the way. So puppetry saved lives. Uh, there's, there was a Captain Kangaroo. There was Mister Rogers. And then uh, as a little kid, I remember there was this special, this half hour special on PBS and it was talking about this brand new kid show coming on tomorrow morning. And it was hosted by two puppets named Ernie and Bert. And I had never seen puppets like this before because before that was like Bill Barrett puppets and marionettes. And, and then I, they showed clips and then I saw Big Bird. And it, as, it just blew my mind that this was a puppet that could actually walk around and not be hiding behind anything. And I just, watch Sesame Street, even though I knew the alphabet, I just kept watching Sesame Street and then the Henson shows. And then when I was in high school, that's when the Muppet Show was around. And I thought, okay, this guy, Jim Henson can do it and all these people can do it. Maybe I could do it. So I did research the old fashioned way. I went to the library. It's like mm -hmm. Barnes Noble, but it's free. <laughs> and I, I looked up <laughs> and I looked up colleges and there was a, a, a college here in New York, in Brooklyn, uh, Pratt Institute, and at that time, yeah. there was a theater department. And at that time, the teacher of puppetry was the man who designed and built Big Bird and Snuffy. Whoa. And his name was Kermit Love. And no, oh, the frog was it. named after him. It's just a weird coincidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I ended up going to Pratt. And then um, instead of going for my last year, Kermit's assistant, uh, the wrangler at that time, quit. So he offered me the job. So do you want to? like work on Sesame Street. So rather than go back, I took like that half millisecond and said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then I came on the show as the Wrangler and eventually started doing uh, background puppetry. But that's where I met, that's where I met Carol. That's where I met uh, Richard and Fran Brill and Jerry Nelson and of course, Frank Oz. And then of course, like Jim Henson. So that was how I, I got to, Get on the happiest street on earth. Wow, <laughs> amazing! <laughs> and indeed, and uh, and Steve, of course, uh, your story begins well on the Henson side of things, uh, being whisked away to London at a very young age, if I if I recall correctly. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And and when Jim hired me, uh, he. The, the 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 thought at the moment was I was going to be working on Sesame Street, and he changed his mind and brought me over there instead, which was actually kind of good for me because I was working more closely with him and Frank and Jerry Nelson and Richard and those guys. It's a better chance to learn, I think, on an on a ongoing basis. But, you know, Debbie and Carol are the two people who actually got me into the Muppets totally. Uh, mm -hmm. They kind of recruited me in after meeting me in Atlanta at this puppetry festival. Um, we knew it was a here when we saw one. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Oh, <laughs> even, even if you thought I was right terrible. Away. Anyway. Right away. You, you definitely have to join the Muppets and we called uh, Jane and said, you've got to go see this guy. He's, he's, he's the one, you know, and I think Jane did call you, didn't she? Um, well, more like actually Carol called me first. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, frankly, I mean, I spent the weekend with you guys and there were a yeah. puppeteers yeah, there. And I thought, I think we exchanged addresses. In fact, I know we did cause I still have the card where you oh. wrote down how to get in touch with I you. I wish guys. I could hear you. You're frozen. Oh, well, anyway, uh, so, you, um, did you say something funny? Because I didn't. No, know. no. I was. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I was saying that I still have the card where you wrote down how to get in touch with you and Carol. Oh. And 
I, I remember thinking that it was wonderful to meet both of you and I probably would never hear from you again kind of thing. And, you know, I just crossed my mind. And then Carol called and said he thought Jim was looking for people and I should try to audition. That's right. Now I remember. He's and right. then I then Jane came along and she happened to be, you know, coincidentally coming through Atlanta, of all things, in the next couple of weeks. And we met and so forth and so on. But my yeah. time on, but so as a result of Jim putting me on The Muppet Show, um, I kind of thought I would never have the opportunity, not only to work with Carol, but to work on Sesame Street. Uh, I thought, well, this is, I'm on, I'm this other sort of group of Jim's people. And it wasn't until Jim passed away in 1990 that the opportunity presented itself um, right. because of Kermit a little bit, but mostly because of Ernie. Right. And I was first asked to do Ernie's voice for toys. Um, <clears throat> that they were trying to keep Ernie going. And I think I did about a good year or two just recording the voices for toys. And then when it came time to cast him, um, it, it, there was about three or four people who were considered. And uh, I, anyway, I ended up doing it, but it sort of made sense uh -huh. that I had already started to settle into the character a little bit. So uh, anyhow, so so it was a thrill for me to finally get to Sesame Street um, because it is Sesame Street in 1968 that really solidified for me what I knew I wanted to do in my life. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily to work with Jim Henson, it was to do something like that. And uh, so, so Sesame Street to me was just like coming back to this place where it all started for me. <clears throat> and, I, and I loved every minute of it. Outstanding. Yeah. As, yeah. as again, as me and my generation and generations subsequently have enjoyed all of it. Although I will add the caveat that my, I don't think my mother will forgive either of you for, uh, me running up to it in my young age, every piano I saw, I'm banging my head against the keys. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't hear that. <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> Me too. She, met, she brought that up at a family dinner uh, about a couple of years ago, and I just said, well, at least you never gave me a bunch of desserts. So like, seven layer cakes, because <laughs> I would have gone down those stairs. <laughs> Rolling them yeah. so. And for those of you not old enough to remember, this was kind of the early Sesame Street stuff that yeah. got phased out uh, after mm. letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When my son, who is 15, now going on 42, when he was a, a baby, we would show him, um, there's this disc set called uh, Sesame Street Old School because we wanted to introduce him to Sesame that we grew up with. Yeah. So there's this animated like disclaimer in the beginning <laughs> saying that some things Not good were done music. then. And just like, so, you know, even though we're teaching over, under, round and through, like don't go to a construction site, kids. Don't go through <laughs> rusted tubes. <laughs> don't go across sources. <laughs> yeah, just like, you don't make it fun. Yeah, we made fun. A disclaimer saying this is why your parents are so weird. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I, I thought I thought Sam the robot was awesome, and why they discontinued mm. him is will always be a mystery to me. Because unless the, unless the apparatus was just really hard to 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 work with. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't understand why that went off. It, I think it was on Jerry. Jerry was in it, wasn't he? Yeah, was it Jerry Nelson. Yeah. In, in the in the book, the Sesame Street covered. They just said it. Just did. They felt it wasn't connecting to the kids, so they just sort of let the character slip away. So. Maybe it was too soon for that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was maybe, before Star maybe. Wars, and they had yeah. the, the droids on a couple of seasons later. So it's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's Jerry true. just said, "I'm really sick of being in these big costumes." <laughs> 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 like, like Jerry was in snuffle up against all the run. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, well, then he gave it to Marty. <laughs> well, maybe too soon for poor Sam the Robot, but it's not too soon for our audience questions. Our team hey. let us know we've got some. So let's go ahead and roll our first one. And this comes from, from Frank, who would like to know what is your favorite Sesame Street moment? It's not Frank Oz, is it? <laughs> Working <laughs> with Frank was my, my favorite thing. Frank. I would love working with Frank. Yeah. He's here to make sure nobody's talking smack about him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Who's uh, taking this? Uh, it sounds like you just volunteered, young lady. I'm, I, I got a little frozen here, so I don't know what to what? do. Go, go ahead, Debbie. Uh, well, I'll answer it because this was a, a question that Carol got all the time. I'm sure everybody does, but his favorite moment, I think the one he was most proud of too, uh, was when the, uh, the show that they did about Mr. Hooper's 
death. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a, a real emotional uh, thing that everybody went through. I know that they, they took it on the first take because you couldn't do it better. Everybody's real tears were real. And um, I have right here in the house the, you know, how Big Bird draws everybody's picture. And then he holds up Mr. Hooper's picture and asks when he can give it to him. And so that's one of the prized possessions here in the house is the picture of Mr. Hooper. Hmm. So I think that would be, you know, that would be the answer for, at least from Karen. Yeah. Certainly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, for, yeah, for me, it was uh, um, back um, during, um, the, um, it was 2002. And it was uh, around March, 2002. And it was about six months after 9-11. And as a result of 9-11, Nile Rogers, who wrote We Are Family, did this uh, celebrity version of We Are Family, getting all these celebrities. So for the six month anniversary, he wanted to do a kid's version, but have the celebrities kids would know do, do the song and be a part of it. And so it was really fun because a lot of the non-animated characters got to go to each other's set and, and shoot. So I was really proud that Bear got to go on Sesame Street and stand <laughs> among the Sesame Street characters. Yeah. And you thought Bear was big, but suddenly standing next to Big Bird and Snuffy, he looked like a teddy bear <laughs> next to these two giants, <laughs> which was great. And then it, it, it worked out because at that time at Kaufman Astoria, Bear was shot upstairs where Sesame Street is now. And Sesame Street was downstairs, so we just took uh, Bear downstairs. And before that, Carol uh, came upstairs with uh, Big Bird, well, I said Big Bird, and we took a, a picture that of was Bear and Bird together, but Carol didn't have the legs on. That was wonderful. So, so we're behind the couch, so this way you can see Big Bird from the waist up mm -hmm. and not see his jeans like coming out from the bottom. And so that was like, like that my proudest moment, that the show that I grew up with, that my character got to be a very special moment on that street. That's great. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Emilio, how about you? Well, I mean, there were so many, so many things that, that that we did that was so fantastic. I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I love when we went on location. You know, we went to Puerto Rico and uh, we went to the Crow Reservation out in Montana. You know, yeah. uh, and so many things. But but I think the one thing that sticks to my mind is because it was such a such an event. Uh, and we we filmed it for I mean it was like a couple of weeks work it was like like filming a film a movie you know and that was Luis and Maria's wedding the wedding you know that whole thing build up to to the day when Luis and Maria got married and and with uh, with Elmo you know saying don't drop the ring Elmo no, don't drop the ring that, that whole thing and then the reaction that that. Uh, that everybody in the world had. I mean, they thought it was the most fantastic thing that had happened on Sesame Street. And and all of us were just like so happy to do that, you know? And uh, yeah, I, I think that was a highlight. That was a highlight. Can I yeah. toot my own horn here? Of course. Um, that was my idea. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember you told me, yes. That's you suggested right. Luisa Maria get what married? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Wow. <laughs> Carol brought the suggestion into the producers, and then it started rolling from there. Yeah, and you know what? What better right idea than to have the two Latinos on the show? You know, get married, have a family, and then do that whole thing and show kids, yeah. you know, how Latinos marry and have kids and have a family, and, yeah. and, and have their their you know place of work. I mean, it was like a regular family. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was beautifully done. It really was so special. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's on it's on HBO Max now. I was like cruising through, and they have so many oh. episodes of Sesame Street from the past, and they have the wedding episode on HBO oh, Max. Yeah. You can watch it again. Oh, I and, like I, and like I tell you, we, we shot that not just in the studio. We went all over New York, Manhattan, Brooklyn, wherever we were shooting, you know, that, that place where Luis is trying on his tux. That's, that was downtown somewhere on Orange Street or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. So, and Steve, what was your favorite memory? Well, you know, oh, there's so many things. Sesame Street, to me, because it was such an inspiration to me as a kid to get into doing puppetry altogether, um, I always, I've said this before, but I always had this idea that once I turned off the television, uh, if you went over, you know, and knocked on the trash can, Oscar was in there. That, that it was, it, it felt like a real street to me. The, the sense of community there 
uh, was so strong. And I think it was so key to the success of the show was that connection with the audience. And I know the first time I ever walked on the set to work, I had visited before, but the first time I walked on there to actually do something with Ernie on a show day, uh, I, it was just exhilarating to me. Um, I can't even remember what we were shooting. I was just, I was, I was in awe of it. I was, I was a little bit starstruck of everyone. Um, but it felt like I had just gone to another street in New York to me, you know, and I always tried yeah. to put that in mind, you know, as I, whenever I was there working, that it was that these were, you know, for years, I, like so many people, I called Emilio Luis. I, he wasn't Emilio, he was Luis. He always was. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's just the way it was for me. And I loved staying inside that, that sort of fantasy part of it to keep it alive, you know. That's true. Nice. <clears throat> I think for me was it came much later when I was I well aged out of the show, but when when the, I had gotten word that Mr. Snuffleupagus was going to be outed, and I took umbrage with that. What? No, Mr. nobody's supposed to believe it, Mr. And then I found out why. I talked to the story that they didn't want children to think if they had some serious trouble that they couldn't go to an authority figure and be disbelieved. And I thought. That absolutely, I I cannot take umbrage against that. I think that's, yeah. a, that's a very, it's a very, it's a very wise thing, and that's I think that's the curious thing about the show too is that it 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 very smartly evolved in all kinds of right directions. Again, in the Mister Hooper episode, which yeah. uh, I just it, it, how incredibly courageous to no let's let's acknowledge the past, let's, let's acknowledge let's acknowledge death yeah on a, on a children's show. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, again, yeah, uh, Carol's finest performance. Oh, now I, I wanted to hear that, and you're frozen. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I, that was uh, that was just an in incredible thing. I want about Mr. Um, Mr. Snuffleupagus being, you know, outed, so to speak. Uh, Carol always felt that he loved that it, you know, that they were going to do that, but he always felt that they did it too quickly. He thought it would be much funnier if they drew it out and say Bob saw Mr. Snuffleupagus first and then nobody believed oh. Bob. And then one by one, people were seeing it and it would just kind of be a funnier bit. Like seeing yeah. Bigfoot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he that always kind of bugged him because he yeah. thought it would just be better. <laughs> could, have, could have gotten a whole season out of that. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, outstanding. Uh, Frank, thank you so much. That was a great question to start us off with. What do we have next? From Ask Blenders, what's your favorite thing about being a puppeteer? Whoa. And for Emilio, uh, for Emilio, I'll say what's your favorite thing about being an actor? Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Emilio, why don't, you, why don't you take, why don't you start us off? Oh, wow, being an actor. Well, I, you know, I've been an actor since I was 14. You know, I started in school, and then, of course, you know, it's just been like forever. Uh, I started working professionally 52 years ago. <laughs> so I'm an actor, you know, what do I like about it? I mean, uh, the, very, the very idea of just being on stage or in front of the camera and, and being or trying to be somebody else, you know, interpreting uh, another human being, you know, it can get very interesting, especially when you're doing, when you're doing drama or when you're doing comedy. Even when you're doing Shakespeare, you know, it's it's an amazing thing doing another another human being or interpreting another human being. It's very yeah. good, very good. Noel, how about you? Um, well, I mean, I am an actor. You just don't see my face, so I mean, I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, and, and and Jim believed that too. You know, we just we just act from the wrist up. So I mean, we are actors. So, but for me, it, it's it's the fact that I can be anyone or anything. Um, that, I, that I couldn't be as a, as, a, as a human. I remember as a young age, I wanted to kind of be an actor, but I realized I would probably be typecast as, you know, gang kid number four or drug addict number five. or And so I couldn't play, you know, Abraham Lincoln, but now I could be Abraham Lincoln's hat or, you know, <laughs> George Washington's teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, now with Lin Manuel Miranda, you can be George Washington. Yeah. <laughs> you can yeah, right. Whether you're black or female, you can what? do it. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, so yeah, so I could just be like anyone and anything I want to be. Very good, very good. Steve, how about you? Um, you know, it's it's funny puppeteers in general, and I think it's true with the Muppets too, but maybe lesser so. Um, 
tend to do everything that it takes for a production to happen, especially the smaller the production gets. And I'm sort of back to that at this stage in my life. Um, you know, they build the sets, they write the script, they direct it. If it's on video, they shoot it, they edit it. They, you know, they, they build the puppets, they do everything. Um, and that's interesting. And I love building the backstory and the world for characters. Of course, that's, that's kind of the acting side of it, I guess. But I like really getting into the detail of where a character comes from. And so much of that, I don't think it ever comes through to the audience. I don't think they know those specifics. But I think it's important from the point of view of performing them. If they're really going to connect with the audience, it's nice to have that in your back pocket, you know, yeah. as, as, as a character goes out Come there. On. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> and Debbie, what Debbie, are you doing? Debbie, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little frozen there for a minute. Well, obviously, I don't call myself a puppeteer, but I have puppeteered. Um, probably my biggest claim to fame <laughs> was uh, when we were doing the Muppet Family Christmas in Toronto. And which oh. was one of our favorite things we ever did. That was, yeah. the we did. I think we did that in September or late September and Christmas in our house started then. So it was really <laughs> messy. But um, Jim wanted uh, every puppet that he had in the drawer to be in the uh, the big Christmas carol singing scenes in, in the living room of Fozzie's mother's house. So he comes over to me and he hands me Fat Blue. I don't know if they still call him that, but it's that yeah. everybody knows Fat Blue. Yeah. And he said, I want you to be in the front. It's only lip syncing to Christmas carols, which I know you know. And uh, you know, be in the front because you're going to be hiding two puppeteers behind you who are going to have other puppets up. And I could have fainted right there on the spot, but I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, so if you see Fat Blue in the Muppet Family Christmas, that is I. <laughs> so, and there was a couple of other times too where I had to fill in. I filled in for Zoot once, Ooh. and um, um, let's see what else on Hollywood Squares with. Carol, they wanted Big Bird and Oscar in the same square, so I held up Oscar and uh, didn't have to say anything, of course. And oh, wow. I suppose my big prime time uh, thing was when I did, um, I held up Oscar in the, uh, I guess it was the Emmy Award show, and they was they were celebrating Sesame Street. I forget what year, but it was a biggie. Maybe it was twenty five, and they had a big uh, number from A to Z with all the cast, everybody, all the puppets. And so Carol was in Big Bird, of course. So I wound up doing Oscar on the Emmy Award show. So see, I guess I am sort of a puppeteer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, what, what, what did Carol love the most about puppeteering? Oh gosh. Uh, I just think he, he just loved be he loved the characters that he, got to do. He always thought that Oscar was really cool and he never felt cool in his whole life. So he kind of really enjoyed that he could be this cool person. Um, but of course, I think he loved Big Bird the best because, I, and I think everybody would agree, it, Carol was Big Bird. Big Bird is Carol. You know, it's that's who he is. You know, yeah. but yeah. that's when he when, I, when he would wake up every morning, he would sing to me, good morning, Mr. Sun, in Big Bird's voice. Yeah. Every day. And so he, he just, I think he loved being able to be these wonderful characters that everybody loved. Yeah. You know, he didn't feel good. And his body work and, and as you all did. Yeah. Because once again, you all made us feel good. Uh, you all made us feel special and you all made us feel cherished uh, sitting there in front of the TVs for all those generations. Mm -hmm. And once again, thank you. And unfortunately, GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with the cast of Sesame Street, but it does not have to be yours. If you'd like to chat with our guests like I have today or purchase a personalized autograph, please sign up now at GalaxyCon.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out our schedule of upcoming events just like this one. Gentlemen and lady, any final words for our audience before we go today? No, thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for being here, for sure. Thanks for having me, too. Yeah, it's great to see you guys, too. I hadn't seen you in a while. Yeah. I know. It's so nice to see everybody. <laughs> and this was awesome. And thank you all for, for, for joining us. And stay safe. Wear a mask. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, keep oh, loving puppies. I'm frozen. <laughs> 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 oh, on that note. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this has been my absolute pleasure. I wish I knew that oh, note. I didn't hear it. <laughs> thank you all for joining us here today at the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank you for our audience for joining us today. And thank you for hearing those great questions. Bye bye, everyone. Take care and please keep washing those hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>